evening, uh, we're going to be looking at the next portion of Psalm 119, which you'll see displayed on the screen behind me, uh, verses 65 through 72. And as I mentioned before, though the focus of Psalm 119, as you probably know uh, from the previous uh, sermons or just by reading it yourself, is the law of God, uh, each one of these sections has a different uh, focus or perhaps explains to us either a blessing uh, that the law brings to us, at least obedience to it by the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ and not purely, of course, by our own efforts and works because doing it that way, our works would be nothing but filth and refuse before the Lord, but rather, again, through the grace of Christ. There are other sections that uh, tell us how the Lord actually teaches us more about His law and gives us a greater desire to keep it. This section tells us that the Lord does it through affliction, through difficulties, and I've actually already let, as it were, the cat out of the bag why difficulty is good, uh, because it's sent from the Lord in order to teach us, again, the, the preciousness and the value of His Word in general, and certainly His commandments in particular. And again, I would just remind you, these commandments really describe the kind of life that Jesus Christ lived. Uh, it, this is not a, a system of works by which we might save ourselves. Rather, this is the path our Lord Jesus Christ took. So if we are to be like Him, we need to have the same love in our hearts that He had for these commandments, and we need to seek to keep them out of love for God and a desire for His glory, having been saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. So let's go ahead and begin by reading uh, this section. The psalmist writes, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have forged a lie against me. With all my heart, I will absorb your precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So again, looking at it from the perspective I've already described, that is how we view the law of God uh, to be precious, uh, why we can consider it with the psalmist to be a, a delight and also something more precious than the wealth of the world because it does show us uh, how we might be more like our Savior. Now again, I, I mentioned before that this is something that... Um, the Lord tells us there's going to be a part of our experience, and I've, you've already been asked this question, but I can ask it again. Is anybody here going through any difficulties? I don't imagine any of you are because when you come to Christ, all your difficulties end, right? I mean, it's just a bed of roses after that, smooth sailing all the way to heaven. Well, actually, it isn't uh, because we know from Scripture and we know from our own experience that that is not the way it is. Uh, virtually all of us here are experiencing difficulties. And we might ask the question, why? Why are we experiencing these things? Is something strange happening to you? Is the Lord singling you out and just being mean to you for no reason? Well, no, that's not the case, of course. The Lord brings those difficulties because He wants to teach you something. He wants to teach me something. And this is the way He does it. He doesn't do it most often through easy times. I would say generally He doesn't do that much at all, but rather He does it through difficulties. I mean, I would challenge you to point even to one person in the Bible that the Lord used mightily that did not go through great difficulties, that didn't have a very hard life. Think about Noah. Did he have an easy life? <laughs> The only righteous man in the midst of a wicked world had to build an ark for the salvation of his household. Or Abraham, who left his household and his family and so forth, left it all behind, was even asked by the Lord on one occasion to sacrifice his son. 
It wasn't an easy life for him. Or Joseph, as you know, was sold into slavery and had to, as it were, by God's grace, be lifted out of prison after he had been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and eventually uh, was raised to a place of usefulness by the Lord. And Moses, as we know, had great difficulties as well as when he was in Egypt and when he had to lead God's people out of Egypt. And David, as you know, too, who was often hounded by Saul as he tried to kill him. And the prophets, I mean, Jesus actually points to them as examples of the sufferings that we would experience following Jesus Christ. And you know, the apostles, too, suffered a great deal. Peter, uh, Paul actually would be, I, I suppose, the greatest example, as I pointed this morning. He gives to us in 2 Corinthians a catalog of the difficulties that he had to face. The Christian life is not an easy life. And we know that from the example of Jesus Christ himself. The author to the Hebrews says regarding him, though we don't often think of him in these terms, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. What, the Son of God learned obedience? Yes, He did. As a man, He learned obedience. The Lord, His Father, was training Him as well, and He did it through sufferings. He did it through difficulties because this is the way that the Lord trains you. That's what the psalmist tells us this evening, that when you go through difficult times, you need to realize that it is the Lord who is the one who is bringing those difficulties but remember at the same time that the Lord is the one who means them for your good. He means to teach you something, to teach you to be more like His Son. So let's first of all realize that God is the one who is bringing these difficulties. Now what is the problem the, the, problem the psalmist is actually addressing uh, in this section? Well, he was being afflicted quite obviously. Uh, we've seen other indications in this psalm that he was undergoing some kind of persecution. If we go back to verse 22, we read this, Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimonies. Verse 23, Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Verses 41 and 42, May your loving kindnesses also come to me, O Lord. Your salvation according to your word, so I will have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. Apparently, the psalmist was under attack, and from the words he's using here to describe it, it was some kind of verbal attack. Now, what exactly were they saying against him? What is this reproach they were taking up against him? We don't know specifically, but we do know generally, and it, it was actually one of those things that is perhaps the most common form of attack, and that is a lie. The, he says in verse 69, the arrogant have forged a lie against me. Now, if you know your Bibles very well, you know that there is one who is a liar, and who likes to use lies in order to attack us, and that is Satan. Jesus says in John 8, 44, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Well, why does Satan uh, spend so much time lying? Well, it's because he knows how effective lies are. Now, was Satan the one who was actually bringing these lies against him? Well, again, no, not specifically. But those who share the devil's nature were definitely doing so. The proud, the arrogant. In verse 51, which is again outside of our text, he says this, The arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. And then in our passage, verse 69, The arrogant have forged a lie against me. Again, the proud, the arrogant, those are the ones most likely to do this, the ones most like the enemy, this is his main tool. And then he says in verse 61, which again is, is in our previous passage, the wicked, the cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. So who again are these individuals? Well, again, he doesn't point specifically to anyone in particular, but he does 
uh, generally characterize them in verse 70 as those whose hearts are covered with fat. I don't know how many of you recoiled when I read that because uh, we think of hearts covered with fat as somebody who's, who's like a coronary case, but maybe who's overweight and needs to lose some of that so they don't have a heart attack, but that's not what the psalmist means here. He's talking about a heart that is insulated, a heart that is insensitive to God and to God's law. He's talking about a stony heart, you know, a heart of stone. Now, who is this? Well, this could have been somebody outside of Israel, or it could have been somebody within Israel or the Old Covenant Church. It could be one with an uncircumcised heart, perhaps more likely the case, but it could also be somebody with a circumcised heart. I mean, certainly this describes the people of the world, but sadly, even Christians sometimes can behave this way, they can be insensitive and they can attack even the godly and they can forge lies against them. Now thankfully, if we are believers, even though we have sin in our hearts and we're capable of doing anything the wicked can do, you know, David committed adultery and he murdered and yet at one point he was called a man after God's own heart. Did he love God? Yes, he did, but he fell into sin and we can as well. But the good news is we can't continue in sin because the Lord will bring us out of it as He did David. Uh, this could be somebody in the church. It could be somebody, of course, in the world. It could be somebody in the church. And of course, we, these are things, again, we have to deal with perhaps all the time. I mean, think about this personally. Has anybody ever lied or forged a lie against you? Has anybody ever attacked you with a lie outside the church? What about somebody in the church? Well, what should you do when that happens? Well, first of all, you need to remember the Lord tells you that you need to love your enemies. And as I mentioned on numerous occasions in the session meeting as we're interviewing uh, different you know, uh, candidates for membership, that is the most difficult thing that the Lord calls us to do. But it's something that He gives us the power to do and He expects us to do if we are His children. We must love our enemies, not be enamored with them and love them because they're so wonderful, you know, but rather to desire their well-being. And so if it is somebody outside the church and somebody you know, who is turned to be your enemy, you still need to love them. And you need to seek for their repentance. You need to seek to be reconciled to them whether they're in the church or outside the church, but particularly if they are in the church, because these are your brethren and you are going to be spending eternity with them. So if you've been offended, you need to go to them and you need to seek their repentance. You need to seek to be reconciled to them. But let's not forget, we may be the ones on that end giving the offense. I mean, we might be the ones, even as believers, forging the lie against someone else. Have you ever been tempted to do that, especially when you hear them lie about you and maybe one of your friends communicates that to you. Does that ever tempt you to want to lie about them in order to get even with them? Well, if you're a human being, certainly it does. What you need to do, of course, is pray for strength, pray for greater sensitivity. All of us who have come to Christ have had the stone broken off of our hearts We've had most of the stone removed. We've had most of that fat, as it were, extracted from our heart. We are sensitive somewhat to the Lord and to His law, but none of us are where we ought to be. We do need to pray for a greater sensitivity, a greater love, a greater desire to do what the Lord would have us to do, to pray for a healthier uh, heart, as it were, one that is filled with the Spirit of God to give us the ability to resist that temptation. And if we have, in fact, lied against somebody else, that we go to them and confess our sin and we seek to do what we can to repair the damage that we have done to them. So again, the psalmist here is faced with a particular adversary who is lying about him. And of course, his response is he still needs to seek for the repentance of that individual. But now let's turn to the main point of this psalm uh, and this particular portion, which is not to focus on the enemy so much and the one that happens to be coming against you, 
but to realize whose instrument and whose tool that person is that is forging this lie or attacking you in some way. It is the Lord's or he or she or it or whatever it may be. Because this attack did not come just purely, as it were, from this man's enemy. He recognizes that this came from God. Do you think there's anything that happens in this world that God isn't in control of? I mean, God is absolutely sovereign. And we know that He brings trials. We know that He brings difficulties. God doesn't necessarily always do it directly. As a matter of fact, most of the time He does it indirectly. In most cases, He uses means. And perhaps the one means that He uses more than any other is He uses people in our lives. I want you to think for a moment about uh, Job. Why should we think about Job? <laughs> well, we've been reading the book of Job as we're reading the Bible together, right? Well, what is it that happened to him? Uh, Satan wanted to discredit Job. He wanted to put him on trial, but he couldn't touch him because the Lord had put a hedge of protection around him. So Satan goes to God and he, asks, he basically accuses Job and he, he says, if you just remove all your blessings from him, then he will curse you to his face. And what does God do? God gives Satan permission to do something to Job. And again, Satan could not have touched him unless the Lord allowed him to. God is the one who is absolutely sovereign. And once Satan gained that permission, he sent the Sabaeans in to kill his servants and to take his oxen and his donkeys. He sent fire from heaven to burn up his sheep and the servants who were tending them. He sent the Chaldeans in to take away the camels and to kill the servants who were tending them. And then he sent a great wind to knock down the pillars of his son's house, as it were, so that all of his children died at one time. Now, Satan was the one who did this, and God didn't do this. The Sabaeans and the Chaldeans were responsible for what they did to Job's servants and stealing his possessions and so forth. But we have to recognize ultimately it came from the hand of the Lord. He was the one who was in control. He could have prevented it and he didn't prevent it. Rather, he gave Satan permission to do this. And I want you to notice the psalmist in our text recognizes that same thing about God. Look at verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. He's recognizing the fact that even this affliction that had come his direction was something that God had dealt to him. When difficulties come, we need to understand there's more behind these difficulties than just the people that we happen to be faced with or the situations that we're going through or the things that we encounter. God is the one who ultimately is responsible. He is doing these things, but again, he's doing it in a way that he is not responsible for the sin. Now, I know that that might seem in your mind to cast some aspersion upon God, but not really, because you do need to realize why God is doing this. Why does God allow evil in the world when he could eradicate it like that? He allows evil because of the good that he brings out of it and because of the glory he brings to his name. He brings good things out of evil so that in God's plan, it is good that there is evil, even though we don't think of it in those terms. That is why the Lord allows it to exist. So let's ask then the second question, and I've already told you the answer to it, but let's look at it a little bit more carefully. Why? Why would God do this to you? Why would He bring difficult circumstances? Why would He allow people to attack you? Why did He allow this to happen to Job? Well, the answer is because He loves you. That's why he does these things, because he wants to bring something good through this. The psalmist not only said, you have dealt this, Lord, but you have dealt well with your servant, because he recognized this as the Lord's discipline, which is not just chastening for sin, but it is instruction. It's something that the Lord intends, again, to help him become more like the Savior. Again, remember the text we saw for our meditation, but also earlier in, this, in Hebrews 12. 
The author to the Hebrews, quoting the Proverbs, says this, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. In our call to worship, Psalm 94, verse 12, Blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law. Again, remember, this isn't punishment. This isn't uh, retributive, as it were, or punitive, you know, justice. This is corrective. This is instructive. This is meant to teach you something that you need to learn, something good. I mean, when parents discipline their children, they, well, they do, if they're doing it correctly, uh, they're not doing it to be mean, to inflict pain on the child because you made me miserable, I'm going to make you miserable now, you know, and just really give it to them. No, you inflict pain through your discipline so that uh, the child won't do what is potentially harmful to them again, that they will do the right thing. And that's one of the reasons, too, why we give them various chores and duties to do is we are, are training them and instructing them. That is what we do as parents. But that's exactly what the Lord does for us, His children. And the way that He, of course, teaches us is also through giving us various duties to perform and bringing difficulties into our lives. Once we grow up and we're no longer under our parents' chastening hand, the Lord takes over and, I mean, he, he is disciplining us when we're younger through our parents, but as we get older, then we're more directly than involved with him without the intermediary, and he disciplines us more directly, and the way he does that is most often through difficulties. Now, what good can come from difficulties? Well, look at the results just in our psalm. It helped the psalmist keep the law. Uh, which means to become more like Jesus Christ. He says in verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You know, we often, when things are going well, we become indifferent sometimes to, to the Lord. Uh, remember the prayer of Agur, don't give me so much uh, of the good things of life that I forget you and say, who is the Lord? When things are going well, we tend to forget the Lord. It's when He afflicts us that we remember and return to Him. But when things are going well and we forget Him, we begin to compromise. We begin to go astray. But difficulty and affliction forces us back to the Lord to seek Him and His ways. The psalmist says it woke him up. It moved him and re it basically to renew within his own life Wholehearted obedience, verse 69, with all my heart I will observe your precepts. It helped him learn more of what the Lord actually wanted him to do in the first place. He says in verse 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Uh, the result was it caused him to delight even more in the law of God because he saw more of its value. I delight in your law, verse 70, and then in verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. These are not the words of a man who looked at the law of God as a covenant of works whereby to save himself, but one who saw it as a means to glorify God because he loved him, and he also saw it as a way to avoid future affliction. Because very often, although not always, it's when we stray that the Lord brings this discipline and these difficulties. And when we see how we could have avoided it in the first place, it makes us appreciate the Lord's ways and the Lord's law even more. Uh, one thing that, um, that I think we should have uh, as a lifelong companion <laughs> is uh, Pilgrim's Progress. It's funny how that book keeps coming back, the illustrations in that book, uh, to illustrate what it is we're looking at right now. I mean, now Christian thought sometimes it was very difficult to walk on the straight and narrow path, didn't it? Sometimes he wanted it to be easier, and so he got off the path. And when he did, he found out that was actually worse, because every time he got off the path, he got into trouble. 
And then when he got back on the path, he was very happy to be back on the path. Now, we do need to realize, as Bunyan also showed us in Pilgrim's Progress, that even when you're on the path, there are still going to be difficulties. But it's better to face those difficulties on the path than it is to face them off the path. The difficulties teach us both ways, that God's way is always better. And let's not forget, again, what we saw this morning, and again, just bringing it into what we see here, um, suffering these difficulties, going through difficulties, is one of the ways that the Lord teaches us to be more like Jesus Christ. It's one of the ways in which He helps us to understand Jesus more and what He went through. Paul prayed, remember, that he, that he might know not only the power of Christ's resurrection, but that he would also know the fellowship of his sufferings because in doing that, he knew Christ more intimately, and that was his goal, to know Jesus Christ. So the Lord is the one who is behind the difficulties, and the reason why he brings them is that he might work good things in our lives specifically to teach us more to understand better the law of God and the importance of keeping it because it is the good and right way, but also to help us know Him and His Son uh, more intimately. But finally, let's just consider how we should respond then to this difficulty that the Lord brings. Well, probably unlike the way we, we typically respond to it. You know, well, you as well as I know when things get in our way, we get frustrated. We don't like difficulty. We like smooth sailing. And when difficulties come, sometimes we, you know, we, we, well, most of the time, we don't see them the way we should. As opportunities, the Lord is bringing to help us grow more into His image. So what should our attitude be towards difficulty? First of all, we should be thankful. We should be thankful the Lord is bringing it in the first place because, for one thing, it, it proves that we are His children, as well as the other good things, of course, that the Lord is going to bring out. But again, Hebrews 12, verses 7 and 8, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which we have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So you should be thankful that it's a reminder that you are the children of God. You should be thankful for what the Lord brings through it, how He teaches you more of what holiness is, of what's right and what's wrong, and how it also allows you to understand Christ better and to be, as it were, or to have a more intimate understanding of Him. Secondly, you should pray that the Lord would teach you what He wants you to learn through those difficulties. The psalmist says in verse 66, teach me good, excuse me, Psalm 119, verse 66, teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. And in verse 68, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Well, this is how the Lord teaches you. He teaches you through difficulties. And it, it's easier, I think, to endure those difficulties when you know that God has brought them into your life for a good purpose. So pray that the Lord would show you what He is seeking uh, to teach you. I was looking at uh, some of the quotes. I don't know if you, if you take time to read those quotes, but I try to match the, uh, the, the, the quotes that are on the screen, the ones in your bulletin, with uh, the theme of what we're looking at. Uh, the one by William Wadley. Let me just read that really quickly because it, it gives us a little bit of insight into what it is that, that the Lord will teach us and how there's a correlation between what He's doing in the difficulty and what it is He wants to teach you. He says this, especially look to those sins to which your crosses have some reference and respect. Are you crossed in your goods? Think if you did not overlove them and get them unjustly. Or if in your children, see if you do, did not overlove them and indulge them. And so in all things of like kind, in what God smites you, see if you have not in that sinned against Him 
and so frame to lament your sins and to seek help against them. When the Lord brings difficulties, He brings them in the form of something that He wants to teach us so that we can see what it is and not just be totally in the dark as to what He's trying to do. So pray that He would show you if it isn't already obvious and then humble yourself and accept what it is He is seeking to teach you. Uh, submit to Him. Uh, third, resist the temptation when the difficulties come to resent uh, the person who brings them or to become angry or to become even bitter. And particularly, don't become resentful of God. He's the one who is bringing them into your life for good, and you need to know that He is. If there was anyone in the world who would have been tempted to resent God, it would have been Job. I mean, Job lost everything that he had except for a nagging wife that was telling him that, that he needed to curse God and die. That was an affliction that continued even after the others, you know, had already had their effect. I mean, he lost everything, and he knew that it came from God. He knew that God was sovereign, but he didn't accuse God. Instead, he vindicated God, and he blessed Him, and that even after the loss of all of his children. He says in chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. It's not that he didn't know it came from God. The Lord gave, the Lord took away. He's the one who took it away, but he didn't blame him for it because God didn't owe that to him, and he knew he didn't deserve these blessings in the first place. They were purely of God's grace, and if God wants to remove them, he can do that, and he's still right, and he's still good. And that's what Job recognized. So don't resent God, but instead bless Him because He has a good purpose behind it. And then finally, continue to love the Lord, continue to hope in the Lord, continue to have faith that God is going to work through those difficulties. Everything, He's going to work, everything you're having to deal with together for your good. Again, that is a promise that you can bank on. And it's what the psalmist was looking at. It was good that I was afflicted because of the good things that you have brought. Remember that this is how the father even trained his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And consider the end of that training in his life. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, the author to the Hebrews writes this, In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears, to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, obviously, the Lord's dealings with us are not going to result in this. This is something that was true only of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is equally true of us that when the Lord trains us through affliction, through difficulties, and through sufferings, the end is going to be good. And so keep your eyes on that fact. As the Lord has promised in Romans 8, 28, He works all things together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. If you're trusting in the Lord, know that when He brings the difficulties, that He is the one bringing it, he is going to work it together for good. That is his intention. And you will see that good. It will, in the end, make you more like Jesus Christ, your Lord, whom you love, more than anyone or anything else in creation. So keep your eyes on the Lord's goodness and kindness and know that it is a loving hand that is chastening you. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask that the Lord would give us that kind of perspective so that we would respond to the difficulties in the way we should.